Hello everyone, I'm very happy to be here to share with you some thoughts about uh, our DigiPlus plan. The DigiPlus plan, uh, commonly called the Digital Nation plan, is a eight-year plan launched by the administration at the end of the previous year to further the development of the digital economy, the digital society, and digital inclusion uh, for everyone in Taiwan. And uh, compared to the previous plans, there is some very different architectural decisions that we did uh, when we do the DigiPlus plan. And this is what I'd like to share with you uh, in the context of digital resilience and digital innovation. So for the DigiPlus plan, for the first time, we separate the plan into the four different uh, sectors. The first one, the D in the DIGI, is the development of common infrastructure. And this includes the broadband access, the spectrum management, and all the you know, common digital uh, fundamental utilities that our President Tsai Ing-wen says is a human right to use broadband. And the next uh, letter in DIGI is innovation. Previously in Taiwan, the administration tried to direct the private sector in a kind of plan economy uh, way of what kind of industries to promote and what kind of industries uh, to, to do and what kind of business models to further. But for digital economy, it actually is quite different from the previous economies. While in the previous economies, the government can predict to some accuracy what is going to happen in the next eight years. In the digital economy uh, arena, we simply have no idea. We know some trends, we know some of the underlying technological uh, maturity, but we do not know what the private sector will do uh, in order to fully leverage uh, these digital developments. So instead of telling the private sector what to do, we're now working with the private sector in a collaborative fashion. And through the acts such as the uh, Financial Technology Experimental Act, uh, we're now asking the innovators to tell us what regulations are out of date, what regulations are prone to disrupt, and we work with the social um, innovators and the financial innovators um, to see whether it is actually a good idea to break those regulations for six months or for 12 months in a transparent manner that still protects uh, customer rights and privacy. And what we gain from this kind of uh, experimental act is the whole society can engage in a conversation about this innovation. And maybe it's not a good idea, so we don't do that anymore, but we thank the innovators for you know, um, not being afraid of try trying out some crazy idea. Or some of those crazy ideas turn out to be actually beneficial to the society. And the society would agree to say, OK, now uh, we deregulate this kind of uh, regulations. And so for the next six months after the experimentation period, um, the private sector innovators can now secure more funding, and the government can do a 60-day public announcement to adjust the regulation. So this is the innovation part. Instead of directing the innovators, we're now working with the innovators so that they can show us what's coming ahead and the whole society can engage in a multi-stakeholder um, discussion. And it's not just the private sector. The government, or I should say the governance model of the public sector is also prone to be digitally transformed. What I mean is not just digital technology such as this you know, stylus or uh, this kind of tablet or this kind of uh, high resolution recording that I'm engaging in. It's not just to replace pen and paper with its digital counterparts, but because the pen and paper is you know, not digital, it's actually very hard to uh, collaboratively work on a note. But with digital tools, it's now possible to redesign the workflow using service design, using interaction design, using speculative design, even uh, methodologies to see how the government can work with the people instead of you know, just announcing to the people unilaterally. But this is not, again, what we're used to. 
what we're used to uh, instead is to make a very top-down kind of fashion. But in the DG Plus, we're now inviting the stakeholders from the private sector uh, and from the voluntary sector to join us in a multi-stakeholder discussion kind of way what kind of governance is needed for the government to function in a digital world. And so this is, of course, uh, my main work as the digital minister, is to make sure that we introduce digital tools such as machine learning, such as augmented and virtual reality in a way that actually reduces the burden of public servants so they have more time to make value judgments instead of you know doing works that could be automated. So this is the government's own transformation. That's the G in the IGI. And finally, we have inclusion. One of the more worrying part of the digital transformation is that the digital gap is actually widening if we don't do anything about it. People who have access to the tools of machine learning can now do the work of hundreds of people and cognitive work too. And this applies to all the disruptive tools and also the disintermediation trend that removes the whole sectors of dispatching uh, and puts the actual um, platform economy into the hands of maybe just a few proprietary vendors, we don't know. So I think it is also very important when we talk about social innovation to include social justice and to include the civil society in the dialogue. Because after all, Taiwan has a very active and vibrant um, voluntary sector. Many of the small and medium enterprises are also sponsors to either you know, the CSR, the social responsibility, or the local MPAs, or even as co-ops or other endeavors, some religious, some not, um, to further the access of people who don't have the inclusion in the digital economy and the digital society yet. As a result of this work by the civil society, um, Taiwan is one of the most literate and one of the most network ready society in the world. But we must not rest on our laurels. For every digital technology that's introduced, we must work with the relevant actors in the civil society to determine whether we can distribute this technology's effects fairly and also make sure that social justice is being taken care of when the whole society adopts this technology. So there is a kind of division here. The government uh, works on the development of the infrastructure and on transforming our own governance, becoming more resilient, be becoming more uh, you know, cyber attack immune, uh, becoming more uh, responsive, becoming more efficient, but also leaves more time for public servants to have more empathy. This is something that we can work on. But the balance between innovation and inclusion, and for many uh, entrepreneurs and SMEs, both are actually their goals. This is what we call the social enterprise vision. You can work on innovation and work on inclusion simultaneously. And the government, instead of telling you what to do, should listen to small and medium enterprises and social enterprises and determine how we should collaborate in the future instead of saying, you know, this is the regulations from the past. So transitioning in a digital transformation from the past to the future relies on mutual trust between generations, between people who had vastly different uh, first-hand experiences in policy making and in startup, in, in working on industry. And we begin this by listening to people with opposing views, often because they have different life experiences and somehow find the common values we share. So um, yeah, that's the basic idea of the DigiPlus plan and uh, my personal values when it comes to digital um, infrastructure and digital economy. And I wish you a very successful um, symposium. And uh, again, thank you for listening.